In the name of the one holy and undivided Trinity, amen. Please have a seat. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. I think one of the most poignant parts of the story we hear first today where King David forces Bathsheba. So when the Lord comes back and says, you did this thing secretly but I am going to do the restoration process in public. In the light of the sun, and everyone will know about it. There's nothing more deadly for a family's health or for a church's health than secrets. We don't talk about that one uncle We don't talk about why that one priest left. Strangely enough, though, the thing we don't talk about becomes the thing that comes back to haunt us on repeat, a ghost in the system. Let's hold that for a second. If you remember the continuation of this story, David and Bathsheba's baby dies as a result of David's sin. If you've ever endured a miscarriage or any kind of infant loss, you know how awful that pain can be. And frankly, I don't feel particularly confident in a God that gets at David by causing pain to Bathsheba. That seems That seems wrong to me. Her husband has been murdered, she's been stolen, and then has to bear a baby that's just gonna die because David did something wrong. I just feel like it's a little much. A little too Game of Thrones and not enough loving justice. And people are like, oh, Game of Thrones, it's so violent and awful. I want to say sometimes, have you read the Bible? Seriously, we let children read this. Bathsheba's also notable because she's one of the four women mentioned in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, which is not an easy feat since women aren't technically allowed in genealogies. But there's four women who made it into Jesus's. There's Rahab, who's the sex worker in the wall of Jericho. There's Tamar, who slept with her father-in-law for money because he was unjustly going to cast her away to die and starve. There's Ruth, who knelt at Boaz's feet to earn a place in his family. The Hebrew is coarser. And Bathsheba, this is not an accounting of the esteemed, respectable matriarchs of Israel and Judah. These are low women. Women knocked around by patriarchy and sex and doing what they needed to do to survive. There is something in here that reminds us about God's repeated disdain for what we consider respectable. David is often the attributed, though not the actual, author of several of the Psalms. This story makes me wonder about what it would sound like if Bathsheba got to write one. What would her song or her lament be after this story? Even if I could imagine one, and I'm not a poet, I'm not sure there could be a better expression of her pain than this fragment from today's psalm. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken 
may rejoice. I wonder if you've ever felt like this, leveled by God. And you can't tell sometimes if you feel appropriately humbled in your vulnerability or totally full of rage that pain like this is permissible in a good earth, or maybe both at once. Where do we turn in that moment? I think our little piece from Ephesians is not a help for this, actually. If you look at the collected works of Paul, there's an interesting duality that exists where he has this indictment, this um, terrible theology around the flesh and this exaltation, this holy theology around the body. Um, But neither of those themes seems particularly connected to actual people or actual concern for bodies. He finds the flesh and its continuous wanting for food or human relationship to be overwhelming. And he doesn't really get that other people don't really have that weird relationship with wanting. The picture from today is nice with all the parts of the body working together, but it remains a metaphor It's not actually about broken human bodies. And it is true that sometimes we are just flat broken by love, by God. And sometimes that is right and appropriate. If we loved someone for 50 years and they die, And we wouldn't trade those 50 years for anything, but the price for that love is our grief. Life without big love means life without that sucking tar pit of grief. But is that what we want? Is that how we want to be? Sometimes brokenness is the cost of love. And sometimes when we are terribly broken, or sometimes when we have failed terribly, we don't tell. We don't tell out, like Nathan insists, about what we've done or where we have been broken. I don't know about you, but I hate doing that. I hate telling people about where I broke. It feels like telling someone I failed. And I hate failing. I do not like losing. I don't play board games. Aaron and I had to learn this the hard way. We don't keep count at mini golf. I don't like it. Sometimes, though, all of those things happen all at once. Failure and brokenness and losing. And sometimes I can feel pretty broken by God, by reality, by love. And I'm telling you something that I need to hear, which is that it's okay to tell. It's okay to just say that you don't feel like smiling this morning. Today was a hard anniversary or a hard PTSD day. It's okay to stay home from church if what you really need is five minutes in your own brain to breathe and think. We'll be happy when you're back. It's okay to say no. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to apologize. It's okay. And it breeds health among us. We pray this collect for purity every Sunday about how we are ultimately known. There's no secrets from God. And we start our time together collectively in worship 
by acknowledging that whatever we are hiding from one another, we are not hiding from God. Make me here of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. There is joy and gladness in knowing we're not alone and in starting again. There is joy and gladness in being a community of walking wounded, remembering that we're all carrying something. There is joy and gladness in being together without the horrendous burden of having to be perfect. There is joy and gladness in the honesty of God when we mimic that honesty with one another. There is joy and gladness in the delights of the body. There is joy and gladness in coming home to who we really are. There is joy and gladness. The broken body we know intimately is not the last word. <laughs>